from HP. From HP. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I first wanted to start, um, we're building a web application, HP, um, but we're, we're, we're partnering with Wirestone. Um, I can't really give a good description of Wirestone. Maybe, Kevin, if you could just spend talk, talk to us for a second about it. Uh, so Wirestone's a digital marketing company. Um, we do a lot of uh, kind of advertising and marketing campaigns for Fortune 100 companies. So we've got clients like HP and Microsoft and Facebook. Um, and so we do a lot of uh, websites, advertising, videos, uh, all that kind of stuff. And we have an embedded team out at HP um, working with Matt and some of the other guys that are here. Yeah, so um, everything I'm talking about today was a joint effort between the two, to the two, um, the two different teams. Um, we've got a couple of a few names on here. Um, this is just kind of a, a start to it. We actually have many others on our team as well. Um, but I wanted to just kind of give some credit to, the, to, to, to everybody on the project. Um, so our, our team at HP, we're building a, a storefront application. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I, I can't actually go into a lot of detail what we're building, but um, it's not really relevant for, for this conversation. Um, we're kind of a mid medium scale project. We've got about 30 engineers. You saw we have about 10 UI developers. We have about 10 back end developers. Um, the back end guys always kind of start working on the front end as well. Um, uh, with Angular, of course, you guys might have already started to realize this, but it makes it a little bit easier to, to go back and forth between the two. So. Um, everybody's kind of enjoying and learning a lot with Angular. Um, our back end is Java and Spring, um, and we use Maven for our build. Uh, in the past, we built our entire UI on JSP, and as some of you who use JSP or ASP probably know, um, there's not a lot of decoupling that goes on between the back and the front end with that type of environment. Um, so in in January, we were starting to look at new UI frameworks. You know, on the client side, everything's going that route when we looked at Angular and uh, we decided to go you know, entirely Angular Rust based. So our front end is all Angular. We had <coughs> API on our back end services and, um, and we've been kind of working, migrating all our JSP pages to that. Um, and what this has allowed us to do is actually um, allow the UI developers to run it completely independently of our back end. Um, in fact, I'll show a little bit later about how we can mock out some of our services. Uh, our backend services so that um, they can actually do UI development before the services are even available. Um, when we first started, we used a Yeoman uh, generator to build our first app. Um, I can't really give you the version because it was in January and they've changed the name so many times since then. But there's basically, if you go to Yeoman website, you can see that they've got a bunch of different Angular templates. Um, there's one that's most popular with the most number of stars and forks. Uh, we picked that one, but since then we've actually uh, replaced quite a bit of it um, just to fit our needs. Uh, today's discussion, I'm going to talk mostly about the unique things that we've encountered using JSP and Maven um, specific to our build. This whole topic is build. I didn't want to talk about, oh, we use Grunt and Usement just like everybody else. I wanted to specifically talk about JSP and some of the things we've done for that. Um, Here's kind of a quick picture of our build environment. On the on the left there is our dead Jenkins box. He died two days ago as we were hitting beta. And uh, this was just sort of an in memorandum for him. Um, on the top right, we have a box that's our UI. Um, all of our UI development can happen within that box, uh, which has greatly improved our um, development cycle for the UI. Uh, I have a little app, Angular app right here. Uh, our web app runs in Grunt just like everybody else. Um, we, uh, we do have a node server that kind of mocks out all of our REST endpoints that our backend will use or will support. And that's where we can actually create um, basically the mock versions of our REST endpoints, mock data, um, allow our UI guys to um, develop the uh, all the front end templates, all of the uh, uh, controllers that, and factories and services that actually talk to uh, those REST endpoints. Um, a lot of it's happy path, but at least it gets, you know, allows them to just kind of keep, keep coding. For our testing, we use Karma for our unit tests. Um, we use, Karma's got this um, coverage plugin called Istanbul. 
that kind of allows us to know um, what our unit test coverage is. And then on the end-to-end -end side of things, um, at least end-to-end -end in the context of that blue box, uh, we use Protractor. Um, we use Bauer and NPM. We'll go a little bit more into um, the unique uh, things that we've had to solve with Bauer. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, real quick. So does that mean that that Node.js server replaces like your internal fixtures for unit testing and everything? Uh, no. Um, so uh, for, for Karma, for unit testing, we're entirely Karma based and we put everything within, within the Node uh, uh, Mox, um, but, or uh, Angular Mox. Uh, this is just purely start up a server, want to see what the UI looks like as I build it. Um, we have a watch on it so that it basically will refresh, the server will refresh um, your page whenever you, you, know, you save the files or whatever. So you can at least just see what the templates are doing as you change them or, or whatever. So it's sort of like mocking out our backend, basically. It's purely happy path. The unit tests really are what, what cover all our error cases. Good question. Um, we use on the Java side, like I said, we have Maven. Um, when we do a deploy, uh, Maven's package is basically a WAR file that we then can throw up into Tomcat and onto Amazon. Um, we have a Maven step that actually will launch the grunt build and package that in to, um, into our WAR file. Um, for the Java side, we use Jacoco um, for our code coverage, Sonar for static analysis, um, Jenkins, and then we use Garrett for build review or for our, our code review tool. And then on the on the server side, you know, when we do actually do system tests, we use Selenium as end-to-end, -end, you know, back-end with front-end. We use Sauce Labs for once we actually have a public deployment. Um, we highly recommend and them. We were built, you know, when we ran our own Selenium grid for a long time. It was very expensive to try to test across all browsers, um, all versions of OS's. Sauce Labs just kind of does that for you. Uh, and then we deploy on top of it. Since I only have 10 minutes, I'm kind of fast with this slide. I can go into uh, any more details if you guys have any questions on that. We can go to some code examples. Yeah. So you got all your front end stuff, you're deploying that. I imagine it's being served up from a JSP, but with Angular components and front end stuff from that. Yep. Um, and then the REST API on that same one there, they're deployed to the same box or? Yeah, and actually, we have a slide that kind of talks of, we'll talk about that. You know, kind of our options on that were. Um, and, and you guys are all going to encounter the same thing, or probably already have. You can deploy your Angular app statically on a CDN from app dot you know, whatever you know, dot com. And then you can have your backends on a different subdomain, for example. Then you have to worry about the cross origin uh, aspects. Originally, we had an IE8 requirement, and IE8 doesn't really support the, the cross origin. Um, so what we found was easiest was for now just throw it all into the same into the same WAR file and launch it all together. And so our, and, and Ben will talk about, uh, in a so few minutes, our WAR file actually hosts the static web page as well. You're still in IE8? Uh, um, we are supporting IE8. Um, we're actually kind of not. We're, we're trying very hard to kick out IE8. Um, we're not with our market right now. So. Um, this is a little bit, this is not readable. So the rest of this presentation is going to be tough. <laughs> Here you go. Um, these slides will be on the web. Um, we have three components to our mock.js server. Okay, we have our grunt file, which, like I said, kind of has that um, that connect step or, or, or the, the, the server step. So if you do like grunt server, it actually launches up a Node.js server um, that can listen to a certain port and can watch your files. Um, we inject a middleware step on that, which um, hosts like a, a Node.js file. And our Node.js um, file, basically there's some code in there that watches for any gets or you know, any, any HTTP calls. If it's a get that it recognizes, um, we have a, like a mock data JSON file on our file system and that's named the same thing as the get request. And so then it'll just go read that file and send back the mock data. Um, we found it's a really quick and easy way to sort of say, okay, this is the, the dummy JSON that would be returned from this particular REST API endpoint, um, and then that makes our UI happy when, when you're trying to actually do the development. Do other people use um, Node.js in this fashion to mock out their, their backends? Okay. I was kind of thinking this might be a little bit new. So uh, the, what we originally started with was um, our UI would, you know, 
do a try, you know, try to go and get something, and if we were in disconnected mode, that try would fail and we would have mock data in our error handler, and that was obviously, that wasn't really working for us. So this was the, the route that was recommended to us from one of our um, class, we had we took a handler class, and he kind of recommended using a Node.js server, and we kind of took it to the next level. Um, so it, at least it works for, like I said, all the, the easy stuff um, when you're trying to actually just build the, the HTML. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben, uh, who's a senior engineer on our team, and he's going to kind of talk to you about how we integrate with JSP. Uh, and real, real quick, sorry. Yeah. Do you have any of this on GitHub? Um, none of this is on GitHub. I think we'll put the actual. Um, so actually, the, there is something we've we've kind of discussed as far as this meetup. We might actually build sort of a an open source. Uh, example application, and Mauricio might want to talk a little bit more about this, but basically as these different groups kind of contribute um, through presentation material, we might actually build up kind of a, an example application um, that would allow us, you know, people to give examples in the future and everybody would have kind of context about, you know, I don't need to tell you about my storefront code, but we can all refer to this example application, and I think we could put something like that on GitLuck or GitHub that, that we can yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but these slides will be made available. Um, we've cut out all our proprietary stuff, but I mean, the, the general. <laughs> uh, my name is Ben. I'm a senior engineer at HP. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple slides on how we integrate with JSP. There was some question about, you know, how we do Angular app with JSP, and mention of cores and some other things. So one thing that we did was we. Uh, Created a stack and again, it's still not readable up here. Um, but we have an anchor, a, a, a grunt task that will go through and read our base HTML pages, our landing pages, the index HTML, which has the include modules and all that. And uh, it will read through and add uh, JSP tags in there so that it allows our back end server to throw it up with uh, JSP in it. What that allows us to do is there's some two items that you can't really read here um, that are set by the server, which is the CDN URL and our server URL. What that allows us to do when we want to is have our back-end code, um, you know, obviously it's going to be on the server, but have our Angular code on a CDN for performance reasons. It's a lot faster to serve off the CDN versus off the Tomcat server. So this allows us to not have to worry about cores information and cores problems and still get the performance benefits of having all of our JSP and HTML hosted on the CDN. I don't know if you guys have problems to deal with uh, cores yet, but you're one of the haters. Um, so what this will do is we'll go through and add whatever the required JSP tags are. Um, you know, not everyone here probably uses JSP, but the idea is that you can grab our root uh, HTML and convert it into a server uh, you know, file that can be dished out of whatever your backend is, whether it's you know, um, Java or it's ASP or whatever your choices are. It allows you to bypass the, the, the CDN problems and course issues. So this is one of the, the nice things that we found. Another thing that we found that was really nice and useful for us was uh, the ability to have our Tomcat server up and going at all times with our backend code. You know, you can only do so many happy path testing with the Node.js server. And you actually really need to test, you know, performance issues or test uh, permissions issues to make sure that you have access to endpoint and when you don't, you get a correct error and stuff. You have to have a real server up and going. You can only mock so much. Um, what we did here with this grunt task is Make it so we don't have to shut down our Tomcat server over and over and over, which is an expensive operation. So by running out of a single directory with Tomcat, every time I just do a grunt build, it will go through, replace the files, and my UI is updated in a couple of seconds. Do you guys have, or do you have No, so my, our local development box is we each have our own Tomcat server, but the time to bring up a war is for Java land um, is, you know, maybe 20 seconds or a minute, depending on how complicated your, your uh, war is. Whereas if you only care about your static HTML, you don't need to, to shut down 
you know, a Java application and bring up all of the you know, complicated logic, what happened on app initialization and stuff. So, is anyone, who else is doing, you know, something similar? Is anyone else doing something where they have a back and have to keep shutting down and bringing it up and stuff? So there's a couple gotchas that we wanted to bring up here um, that you know some people may have a problem with, some may not. Um, we use one of the two tools that we mentioned were NPM and Bower. NPM for Runt, you know, and Bower for our UI development. We ran into some problems where our team was basically doing a DDoS on GitHub, um, HTTP behind a, a proxy wall, so every request that we're going to build would go out to GitHub, and GitHub notes that hey, I'm getting a couple hundred requests every, you know, 10 minutes and from the same IP address, they started, you know, rate limiting us and we started getting random build failures um, when we were trying to do our continual integration. So we actually started checking in our NPM and Bower installs, um, which, you know, when we had someone new on the team, they asked why we had to check in, you know, 30,000 files but we had to do it because we were behind a, a proxy, had some performance problems because we would wipe out our Git repository every time and have to reinitialize it. So, um, then another thing that a lot of people are probably using here is ng-min. ng-min is you know, a tool that you can have all your JavaScript in and then it will use Angular to minify, or it will follow the Angular pattern to minify. I'm sure you know, the first time you tried to minify without like using ng-min or something, you start to get lots of problems of a provider not found because it attempted to minify the file but did not follow the, uh, the standard. So ng-min will go through and solve that problem. But we had a huge performance problem with ng-min. We had a problem where it was taking a minute and 45 seconds, two minutes, just to minify about a dozen JavaScript files. Uh, so we went found another one called ng-annotate and it brought it down to a few seconds. So it was one of the highlight that because a simple Google search usually returns ng minutes to top it, but you know, a minute and a half, two minutes worth of time is, is a lot when you're doing continual integration. And, uh, we have a couple more slides for people who might be involved with a, a Maven system, but we didn't really want to talk about it unless there was um, interest in how we integrate with Maven and do Nexus uh, version anyone else here does that. But the slides will be available in case you do want to look at When you say proxy um, with your GitHub issue, yeah. or, yeah. um, did you guys actually set up an NPM proxy? So we had a lazy NPM, and we didn't have a problem there once we started using a lazy NPM mirror. But we had a lot of problems where NPM modules would go through and actually attempt to go straight to GitHub. You know, actually in the NPM JavaScript code, they would attempt to open up a socket and go out to, to GitHub and attempt to download something. Another thing that, you know, on the side that I forgot to mention is we also decided to do it because of um, stability reasons. So with Bower and NPM, it's notorious that they use tilde by default to get a minor version update. So if I do a build on Monday morning and I pull in whatever my favorite NPM or Bower um, tool is, I'm always going to get 1.1.1 one, one, one or something. But it may have a dependency on jQuery, and it just wants the latest 1.5 jQuery. And that may have updated, and that caused random build failures on, that passed on my machine, but it failed over on Mac's. So because of the stability reasons of transient dependencies being auto-updated without our control, was another reason we decided to check it our Git servers, I mean, it's not a big deal for Git to deal with most of this, you know, 30,000 files that aren't changing. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's a matter of, you know, 30 megabytes potentially, you know, minimized, minified, but a lot of the times that you have jQuery 1.2 in your code, because it's all over the place, it's going to be minified and it's going to look exactly the same. So Git or Mercurial are going to handle that very, very well. Yeah. And then if we ever do update, we do an update. You know, it's a, a very conscious effort. There's a, you know opportunity, and then, then we commit all of the, the new changes. Do you want to have any questions about you know some of the build stuff that we do?
right? I don't know who's the next presenter. Yes. Thanks. All right. Okay. Very briefly, the Clara is a startup that uh, is based in Palo Alto, and they started a very small office in Boise that is growing. Um, we are a social network that uh, is dedicated to education, to allow communities to collaborate and contribute to grow together. Those communities need to be made massive communities. So we're talking about four countries wanted to grow in a specific field. For example, uh, Gen Genentech is a research pharmaceutical company and uh, they want to be able to collaborate and contribute mentors and mentees that uh, are separated by region, by uh, logistics, by field of uh, research to know that they are actually doing things that are similar and they can get uh, some contribution together. So um, that's, that's the brief of the company. The company as a startup is having a very different uh, a very different architecture from from what we use here from HP. Um, there it is. What we have is uh, an API that is fully dedicated exclusively to provide uh, data, JSON data. So this API doesn't know anything about UI. It only provides RESTful content. Then we have another seller endpoint that knows everything about UI but doesn't know anything about business body. Okay? So the guy that knows everything about UI is the guy that receives the request. Once we receive, okay, what is what you need to load on, on, on page? Uh, Angular just starts the engine and performs the API calls needed to the API server. Does that make sense? On the Angular yes, we are very, sim very simple about how we love, how, how we include our, our application. Uh, we use Node.js as, as our platform for the UI, and Node.js literally uses list the amount of resources in one monolithic uh, component that says these are the components needed. In the development, we, for, by, by configuration, we decide um, if you want to create a one single um, minified compile with closure, with closure, closure, closure. How do you pronounce closure? Closure. Closure. Yeah. Okay. How do you how do you build a minified file? Or if you want to release the whole list of files, just if you guys have been developing with JavaScript, you know how difficult it is to be uh, triaging issues that are not in the source file one to one, right? So with this approach, we're able to triage uh, the source code directly rather than being dealing with minified files, right? So we do. That's quite simplistic. We use by configuration. We by, by configuration we include all the source files, or we include one single minified file. We don't use uh, really Bower or any dependency uh, tool. We use uh, Log, the monolithic that is going to provide all the required services. Um, what we like about this build strategy is, is, is that it's trivial. It's simple. It allows you to focus all your energy into developing business value. Sometimes you see like uh, you're investing some time on things that are not generating value, and that's that's kind of a uh, uh, luxury that maybe some startups shouldn't be uh, intended to do. Maybe. Um, let's see. As I mentioned, gets out of the way to focus resources on delivering customer value. Um, what we feel so interested on in sharing one of them is to hear the different perspective. The uh, presentation from HP was amazing. I, I quite love it because they are facing quite different problems what we're facing. So if we're moving forward, trying to evolve to a more uh, 
dependency based system, it is quite helpful to understand the perspectives as well as what Beacon is doing and what uh, bodybuilding is, is doing as well. Um, also, we want to share what, what, what we are building. Um, it was very interesting to hear how HP is not only evolving its build system, but the whole workflow. Right, like continuous integration, how, how are they facing uh, the testing with Karma, and that, that's something that we as a startup haven't, hasn't reached yet, but we are, we are evolving. Um, Jason, you want to jump in with something? Uh, uh, hi, Jason Brooks, also a software engineer at Claire. Uh, yeah, uh, like Mauricio said, our build system is pretty trivial. We're just using Angular to talk to uh, uh, API uh, with, with uh, Django. All the API points are, you know, just RESTful services. So we we run Angular off of Express.js, which is kicked up off of. So our our build process for Angular is pretty uninteresting. It's literally just running some fabric scripts, uh, fabrics of Python uh, shell script, and uh, you know, command line uh, executor um, that literally just zips up. Uh, well, it pulls from the bucket a tag that we put in, zips up those files, uh, pushes them to the build server, which uh, for Angular only runs uh, closure compiler, closure compiler. And then shows it out to our uh, So for building, it's not, not really that interesting for us. <laughs> so, you guys do like full single page applications or like smaller components? Or? Um, right now, we've got a big single page application. <coughs> <laughs> it's pretty obvious to you. Yeah. So, so I think so. <laughs> and do you guys use Run for, for that? No. Uh, uh, we, we're just, like I said, we can uh, fabric. Uh, fabric right. basically just uh, shells are going to be Oh, okay. That's where we're going to you guys? Yeah, so far. I think so. I'll give you the answer. You don't have to deal with the colossal ground file. Right. I think our shell script just calls no uh, package installer and then it's going to be about it. Yeah. Do you guys do any experimenting? Actually, this brother, with uh, rendering HTML at all on the server and then just inserting it with Angular, or is it always uh, a thing? Started experimenting uh, SVGs in the 
that's it. Um, I wanted also to, to share something that uh, I'm doing on my own uh, on Roman Rails. So um, it's, it's quite trivial. Uh, again, it's, it's coming to the, to the same um, same mindset of uh, focusing on delivering customer value. So let me show you what I got. So the context is developing AngularJS apps in Rails with the with the Rails uh, pipe build pipeline. So the example I am giving here is just uh, giving the file system. And if any of you are familiar with Rails. We have um, the application directory where you have different um, tiers that you can um, start developing. One of the tiers is the MVC, the controller, model, and uh, um, you can have also the assets in, in, in the app. So the assets can contain the AngularJS application. That's what I'm trying to show here. We have uh, inside the assets, JavaScript, Angular, and then we have uh, the structure that will look very familiar to you guys, controllers, directives, services. So um, how Rails uh, works with this is it use, uh, provides its own syntax to uh, request what resources are going to be needed in your build. Then just by specifying the, the requires for that build, uh, depending on your configuration and your environment, it can bring the source files or the minified version. You don't have to do it with that. It's just going to do it for you. Um, here, let's see, here, this is the pipeline that I show you in the source code. This is the configuration that is, uh, I, I want the configuration to be Quite, quite encapsulated inside the Angular app so that we are not contaminating the back end with the front end. This is the front end specification and this is the uh, this is the application on Angular. And then um, something that it, it may be quite trivial is that, or maybe for, for the beginners that are starting on, on, on Angular, uh, you need to specify your modules in a declarative uh, form for the minification to, to work or write. Otherwise, you're going to have dependencies, uh, problems during, uh, during the minification, um, under the minification environment. That's actually what you, you, if you wanted to use, if you're using the wrong system, that's what ng man or ng annotate solve is that problem. So you don't have to remember to put in a string form that it's dollar sign scope. Those, uh, those two grunt uh, tasks will go through and search your code and find ones that weren't declared and uh, create that syntax for you. So you don't have to remember, you don't have issues where you rename or reorder the, the parameters and have undefined errors and stuff. You don't have to use the declarative form? No, you do not. As long as you run that tool before you actually minify, it will have the output be the declared form. Okay, so make sure code clear. It's really just nicer to read as well. It's not even ever using or worrying about the declarative form. I'm just letting the tool handle it for you later before the question. Um, I know um, Ryan is going to talk about Geomax, so I'll, I'll uh, wrap up with use uh, brief. Uh, on, on the file system, we have the controller directive services, application, and the app that is actually used uh, uh, using those well structured resources. Something I, I really start admiring about AngularJS is, is cohesive isolation with the UI uh, layer. It's, it's quite annoying when you are jQuery uh, familiar, familiarized with. Because you want to touch the DOM, and then Angular says no. So uh, once you see how the file system starts layering down all the isolated uh, desktop components, it, it, it starts coming up and making sense, and how the build system is able to work 
by itself and do things like what you guys are saying on, on NG, uh, on, the, on the NG, what was that name again? NG yeah. So, um, that's it. Do you, have, do you guys have any questions about this pattern? How to hook up the uh, rails with Angular? talk. I just started my slides like that. I have uh, quite a few notes in the slides for myself, so I'll just ignore those. Uh, let's see here. Okay, let me uh, start by uh, telling you guys who I am. Uh, my name is Brian Jitsi. Uh, I am a software developer. Uh, I work for Viking. Um, we are a, uh, well, basically we're a startup company that makes a super awesome high-tech cloud-managed, subscription-based water drinking systems. Uh, and I would uh, I'd love to go into more depth and kind of explain to you guys uh, what we do. Um, we're on a little bit of a time crunch, though, uh, with 10 minutes, and, and I can just go probably on and on about what we do. Uh, but at the high level, um, we provide these, these systems that you see in the picture, uh, drop them into locations like gyms, airports, uh, places where people kind of go on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Uh, and it's a subscription-based service for them to be able to uh, access water um, with just one yearly subscription, you know, 29 uh, We love JavaScript. Uh, we, uh, uh, we love Angular. We, we're working right now to kind of decouple our front end and our back end. Uh, right now we're, we're uh, running Grails and we're using the, the Grails server pages for most of our views. Uh, so we're kind of just uh, in a transition process right now um, to kind of really, you know, move to more RESTful API type service, uh, serve up our, our front ends kind of independently uh, using basically just, just uh, single page web application style. Uh, <coughs> right, let's get down to business. Uh, we're gonna, I'm just going to kind of go over the high level of our build process. Uh, you know, the, the too long, don't read is basically we just use Yum. Uh, we don't, uh, there are some rare cases uh, in our infrastructure where we do need to uh, include our, our front end in our, our back end logic. Uh, for the most part, we, we're trying to, to uh, serve up the, the front end completely independently. So we do, we do run into some issues with, with cores on all the browsers. Uh, luckily, what we're, we're working with is mostly uh, our, our admin tools uh, at first. Um, so we, we don't really have a problem with, with browsers, uh, and then when we, we do have those issues, we can uh, use uh, JSONP uh, to, to support that if we need, uh, or like I said, include it in the, uh, in the Grails application. Uh, so uh, kind of at a high level, I'm sure most of you know what Yeoman is, but it's a scaffolding tool. Uh, so it just uh, uses Yo for the uh, generators. Uh, uh, and you can kind of, it's an open source platform so people can build their, their own unique generators to do different things, uh, you know, based on whatever your front end needs are. Uh, you know, I mean, it, uh, 
often includes things like Bower support and uh, or Compass or um, all sorts of uh, open source uh, good tools. Uh, and then it's it's often compiled with uh, Grunt as well as the task runner, uh, which which we were using for a really long time. But actually, we decided that we, we don't want to use Grunt. Uh, we wanted to start experimenting with the uh, the new uh, Gulp platform. We really liked the idea of uh, focusing on or, or uh, con uh, code over configuration. Uh, so so why Gulp? Uh, for one, we really like the syntax. Uh, it's it's more familiar to us, uh, being more code driven rather than configuration driven. Uh, it was actually easier to learn Gulp. Uh, than it was for us to try to figure out and, and even read through some of the grunt files. Uh, and it, it comes with a lot more built in. Uh, we like the organization. We're able to really kind of even separate out our uh, different build processes into different folders, uh, making it really nice to say, if I need to edit this task, I just go into you know, the grunt or the gulp folder to the specific file that has that build process. Um, so I don't have to have you know, one grunt.js file that's uh, that's you know massive and, and hard to read. Um, the speed is we had a, a huge speed improvement. Um, it uses streams uh, and it's it's was built from the ground up with that idea in mind to be able to just pipe the data rather than having to create you know these these temporary folders to kind of pass data around. And, uh, it, it allows for a lot more asynchronous action as well. Uh, and then it's it's. Uh, growing rapidly. I mean, as of this morning, there were uh, 635 plugins already, and this is a project that you know has you know taken off just just kind of recently. So uh, everything, almost everything you can do in in Grunt, you can now do with Gulp. So we really like um, Gulp for for these reasons. Um, the the most difficult thing after realizing that we kind of wanted to start using Gulp for our our task runner was finding a, a generator that would work for us. Uh, but we stumbled upon uh, this generator called Angular by Swift. Uh, and it had everything that we wanted to do uh, and everything that we could do in Grunt, uh, but using kind of Gulp as the platform. Uh, but it was even you know, a, lot, a lot better organized and a lot easier to work with. Uh, and it, it just came with, with all sorts of goodies out of the box. Um, uh, some, some notable ones from this list are uh, the Angular UI router. Uh, so I, uh, I use that one personally, we use it in a lot of our projects. It's, uh, it's a really clean, easy, and, and kind of more powerful way to do routing when you have uh, large scale applications like what we're working with. Um, so it was nice that you, when you're running this generator, it just gives you the option, do you want to replace you know, the uh, Angular UI router with the default router? And you just click yes, and it just you know, scaffolds it out for you. Uh, and then it's you know it's got that that list pretty much has everything that um, that we use in our we kind of just use this generator as is we don't we don't even have to make a lot of modifications to uh, the goal files to kind of get it to do what we want it does the image optimization and the res js int uh, it's you know watch which is which is built into goal it's it's really performant and fast uh, you know using compass we don't have to sit you know for you know three to five seconds or even longer if we have a, a really large uh, you know, compass file, it's just, it's almost instantaneous. I mean, one or two seconds, and it's, you know, refresh the page with the, with the changes. Uh, I can, I can kind of go over the build, uh, the steps that we take, but it's, it's really simple. It's just uh, your typical yeoman build process. Uh, we just do gulp build, it, you know, it does all this, plus, plus a lot more. Um, uh, you know, runs the, the hinting, it does the concat and minification, and, uh, one, one key point um, that, I, that I really like about this generator is it includes, I forgot the name of it, I should have put it in my notes, uh, but it's the uh, Angular HTML to JS, I think is what it's called. Uh, it's, a, it's a Gulp plugin that actually takes all those partial HTML files that would lazy load into the app, and it actually compiles them into a single JavaScript file with the templates in the JavaScript. Uh, so when you actually load up the application, it just loads up that JavaScript file and it never actually has to call to the server again for those partial uh, HTML chunks of code for our, um, uh, you know, for our... Uh, so NG templates. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, you know, speeds up our um, you know, application performance tremendously. It adds a, a little bit of load time depending on how many partials we have, but um, the performance throughout the use of the application is a lot better. Uh, and then it's got a really cool uh, extra 
uh, task built in, which is uh, serve the serve the uh, disk folder. Um, and what, what that's really nice is when I was when we were using some of the grunt uh, uh, templates. Um, whenever we did a build, we would often, you know, load the, the file onto the server and then realize that it did something wrong. And it was really hard to debug, uh, you know, what was happening, what was being left out, or what, you know, did we use an absolute URL instead of a, uh, you know, relative URL, and that was causing the problem. So, so this is a, it was a nice command built in where we could just test to make sure our, you know, directory of all the compiled files would run properly, uh, and then we could just push it up, knowing confidently that it would. Work without any other problems, uh, and and what we do after after this is we just load it up to, to S3 and uh, serve it from uh, Cloudflare, so a CDN, uh, and they have really great support for cores, uh, much better than even like CloudFront and some of the other CDNs that are out there. Uh, they're one of the more reputable ones for kind of supporting uh, different configurations. And then let's see. Yeah, so I'm not. Uh, I, I thought I would talk a little fast, and I ended up doing that. So, uh, are there any questions? Maybe heat up a little bit more time. You mentioned Gulp is more performant. Things wrong. What kind of differences do you see? Um, I I didn't actually run any. I never ran any tests. It was more of a feeling sort of thing. I would just as as the the application files would grow and we added more and more processes, we just kind of like feel sluggish. Um, so we never ran any. I should probably have done some performance checking, uh, you know, because I like to know the stats. But it was just kind of a, a feeling thing. It, just, it feels a lot more just kind of responsive than than does. And, and it was significant. I mean, it was you know five, six, or seven seconds uh, that were shaving off some of the, the applications. So. I mean, like you're saying, I mean, uses files for your too, which is super nice. Because I, I work at Body Um We use Grunt. And we've been looking at uh, Gulp a lot because I mean, we've had to combat huge grunt files where we, at this point, actually capitalize on the fact that it's Node and create a build directory, and then use uh, take out chunks of our grunt file and store it in the build directory as like you know, and we don't use like closure. We like closure.js, and then our grunt file we use Node to pull that in, and so that just helps to keep keep it smaller, but. As far as like the temporary directories that you have to create on the fly to pass data around, like piping and stuff like yeah. that, it's super awesome. Yeah, and it's it it made the management process. I mean, this this uh, generator that we found kind of does everything that we want on the box, but even if we were having to add into these new processes, uh, the the syntax for for Gulp is just so easy to work with. Um, like I said, the organization is just you know create a new task in the new folder. It's it's code or configuration, so you can really just point to it required in your you know your main. How much time did you spend um, doing a conversion from a grunt type build to, to the Gulp build? Um, so I, I haven't done a lot from of, of migration yet. I've just all the new projects uh, that we've been working on. We've been starting using Gulp. Okay. Um, we're definitely going to go back and be switching some of the, the files from the grunt configuration to the, the Gulp. It's just kind of like it's not broke, don't fix it sort of thing. But eventually, we do want to move it as we you know, as we start working on them more, making big changes. We swap out.
talk about what you guys are doing on the build system. If not, any questions to other people? Well, maybe our back end stuff is really my uh, area of expertise and they're not my stuff to chat with from it. Yeah, I have the same. I don't have anything put together officially, but if someone wants to come talk to me, um, just to give you kind of a brief overview, we're using Require.js with Angular. So, um, it's, well, I have to hang that to the show, but, um, so we're using Require.js with Angular, so that can be kind of a pain in the ass because you have to inject twice, you have two kind of um, conflicting naming conventions with the module system. They both uh, inject in different manners to do different things, and so that can be kind of confusing. Uh, that being said, once you kind of get past that initial hurdle, um, I couldn't imagine going back to either like using script tags or, or whatever like um, ng-man or something like that. Require is pretty slick because we've been doing every, sing every single thing that we do, like our directives, let's say, will encapsulate it totally in, in a require module and, and most of the times in Angular modules, well, unless we're creating some kind of like service-based suite. And so it's really nice if you're building a small component or, or a small uh, app that uses some base directive that's used kind of all over the place, like a mold or something like that. You can use require and just say, okay, bring in what we use, like a naming convention, like bb dash. So we yeah, bring in bb dash model, and then you can inject that into your module and build like a whole new feature on top of that. So um, in that regard, require has been really awesome. Um, we ran into problems with uh, ng-man, so we ended up using Closure Compiler, and that, that's that's seeming to work pretty uh, work well for us. And we haven't really dialed in like a solid pattern yet to um, group like a collection of services um, versus like a collection of directives. Um, how we inject those because you can do it in many ways, in many patterns, and so. We're still kind of fine-tuning that stuff in bodybuilding, but um, right now it's, it's pretty slick. I mean, Mike, uh, this dude up here in Russia, uh, works in bodybuilding as well, and we were talking about it um, earlier. I work on community, Mike works on uh, commerce, and they haven't really dove into the Angular stuff yet. And what you and I met about a month and a half ago, yeah, and kind of went over this stuff, and he shot me an email just kind of um, out of nowhere, just coincidentally this morning, kind of telling me that he's been digging into it, and uh, after a little while, of you know, can you pass the hump of using Angular and uh, Require together? Um, how a kick ass it potentially can be. So um, it's it's one of those things that um, I wish I had something to put in front of you guys right now because it is it is pretty slick. But um, it's also probably one of those things that's going to go away with Angular two uh, two point and when the browser starts supporting the six modules because then. Um, you'll actually be able to do true kind of uh, like modules with Angular instead of kind of how they're done um, with dependency injection and stuff like that, which is still nice. But it would be really nice if you didn't have to have like one big JavaScript file or um, you know a stack of script tags or if you use like head.js or however you're building your application together before you run it through a minifier. So um, if you want to do it right now, I totally recommend doing require. Uh, with Angular, just because it is super nice to just call in what you need when you need it and build stuff on demand. Uh, AMD is pretty awesome. It kind of brings some of the stuff that, uh, if you're familiar with server side programming, uh, you're probably already familiar with modules and importing stuff and, and reusing and stuff. It brings that functionality to the client, especially if, as you're offloading stuff from your back end to your front end. It's super nice to have that functionality. So you don't necessarily have to wait for browsers to catch up and stuff like that. Um, we have a pretty distributed dev team as well. Um, how many niche do you think? Uh, dev teams? Or devs? Dev yeah. Teams we probably have. Yeah. In our office teams. here in Boise and Costa Rica, uh, we have like eight or nine dev teams down in uh, Commerce and Community Center that house maybe 70 devs or something. Plus the whole company. Yeah, and so um, <coughs> one thing that is, is kind of a, a a huge issue that we've ran into with such a distributed uh, team is inconsistency and inconsistency. And so what we've done is we started using Yeoman and we went in and created, because it, 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 
we had to do some finesse to get require JS to work with Angular. Not in a, it's it's easy enough to get it working on its own, but to get working in a way that makes sense, it's easy to maintain and has integrated even test. And so um, when you have a require config, you it breaks out exactly. It, it could theoretically it could be uh, in your grunt file, in your HTML that's rendering it, and for your unit test grunt config. So that's three potential places where you have to go and edit the same stuff. So there was a lot of kind of plumbing that we had to do to make sure that, okay, let's just pull all that out and just load JSON for our config and just pull everything in in one spot so we can edit it. With little, little low level plumbing type things like that that we didn't want um, dev team B to redo that we just did all that work. So we went and capitalized on Yeoman. It's actually pretty easy to use a generator um, with Yeoman. So, yeah, we, we put together an Angular require uh, uh, generator through Yeoman, and so far it's uh, a few of the other dev teams at Bodybuilding that have jumped in and started working on Angular have been using that. And that's kind of been a way for us to kind of control consistency and patterns uh, of development across all these teams. Um, so yeah, Yeoman's been a super helpful tool for us, and it, that, again, is still in its infancy at Bodybuilding as well, because uh, uh, we'd like to build ones that, you know, Build services or directives because I mean at the end of the day it's a scaffold generator. So you, we want to just be able to, right now you can just go like yo generate require in your app, but we want to be able to you know build like just a scaffold out of directive because you want to build a direct service or something like that. So, um, yeah, that's I think about all I can shoot my hip with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I'd be interested to hear about your guys' um, problems that you ran into with your proxy. Because it sucks when, because we really dove deep into Bower and NPM. Um, each one of the projects that we built, like us, so like a, uh, we built like you know, directive agency. Um, we're actually storing those right now temporarily on artifacts as tarballs and fetching them with Bower, not really using semantic versioning. And so we'd like to get to a point where we're hosting an internal Bower registry and then we're in the middle of standing up an internal um, NPM registry, registry, which Artifactory actually offers with their pro package. And so um, we can just locally configure our .NPM RC and then hit a proxy first looking for stuff and see if it's cached or if it's there. If not, then hit the actual uh, NPM registry and you know, everything that's hosted in GitHub and stuff like that. And so that's something that like we really want to look into because we are like, if I build a directive, I'm storing an artifactory, and if I'm building a new like micro application or something like that that uses that directive, then I can just throw that in like, we'll call it modal, like my example earlier. We'll throw that in Bower, my Bower.json, and then I can just go Bower install, and it pulls down all my directives, that I, my custom in-house built directives locally so that I can start using them for development. So um, conceptually, it's kick-ass. Um, we're not quite there yet. But I, yeah, I'd, so I'd like to really kind of give a go to this and maybe see uh, uh, what problems you guys are going to The way we are right now, we never call npm install and we never call Bower install unless we're bringing in something new. And that's just, you know, greatly improved our reliability and our build times. Yeah. And we cut down our build nice. times probably by five minutes. Yeah. Three to five minutes. And yeah, no developer ever has to do it. Totally, totally. So, but I mean, as we're on Git, so if you were on this version or something else, you might have some problems with that many objects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, at the same time, it kind of sucks to check that stuff into the, the repo as well. It depends, like, <laughs> what, what's your what's your SCM? Um, Git. Git, so Git's gonna handle that just fine, especially with what Git team and Bower are, it's very incestual, where you pull in one app or one dependency, it's going to depend on the same version of jQuery that you might have called out, but Git's going to realize with the hashing algorithm that the same file. So in the .git folder inside your refs there, it's going to be the same object. So your file Sorry. system is going to look like it's large, but the actual .git folder and how it's versioned, it's going to be a lot smaller. Because yeah. there's a lot of commonality between those files. So I'd be curious to see how it works out for you guys long term. Because in a way, it kind of reminds me of the old Java days when People would just check jars into their project. Yeah. Right? It seemed very simple to do um, before Ant and Maven came along, but mm -hmm. people pretty quickly abandoned that because it's 
Yeah, that's one of the, the, the things that I don't like about NPM and Bower is how they do their version and the fact that it is so incestual and they don't do something like Nexus. Where if I pull in, like I said, a dependency, and it has dependencies on dependencies on dependencies, you know, that JavaScript file is in there, you know, a dozen or more times. Whereas, you know, other build systems have solved that problem by, you know, by solved by using Nexus or some, something like that. So you don't have that bunch of copy and paste. And it doesn't re-download that file a bunch of times. And I, I, I'm looking forward to the day that the front end UI goes in that direction. We just ran into so awesome. many build problems. Like we would be down for, we couldn't hit GitHub for a day or two sometimes, and which completely box. I mean, you can't build. So we had to, we had to choose a different alternative. And then another one, the proxy didn't fix that, or the you know our, our local um, cache didn't fix a lot of that. But then again, it's the dependencies on dependencies. So with Maven, you know, you're pretty explicit about your versioning, whereas with Grunt um, and Bower, with Bower and, uh, and NPM, it's, it's that. Well, you can kind of just get this minor revision or, or above, but you're dependent on somebody else defining that minimum revision as being truly non-breaking, right? And as soon as somebody breaks a minimum version, you know, in your dependencies, dependencies, your application stops working, and you have no idea why. And it's not because of what you're directly dependent on, but it's one of the other dependencies. Yeah, that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for us, is we had a dependency on one of our um, systems that explicitly called out that it wanted version one, two, three of something, and it had a dependency on 1.2.x. And over the weekend, they upgraded from 1.2.1, so Friday builds worked, but on Monday, when they upgraded, they put in a breaking change that broke our build system. And so if you happen to have in your NPM repository or local machine code from Friday, you built fine, but there were random people in, you know, in the organization in our CICD process that just completely fell on the face. And the only solution was to what we ended up doing in that particular time was just remove that dependency. We reworked our entire code and said, we, will, we, we won't even call specifically version one, two, three of that application. Because we don't have control over them saying, I want 1.2.x. We have no control over that. And by checking it in, we haven't had any of those problems anymore. So I, that might not might be issues that other people have, but that was the straw that broke our camel's back. That broke the camel's back. And of course, with JavaScript, you don't necessarily even get a build time error. Something sort of odd starts happening with your web application, and you don't know why. And you hope your tests cover. Well, that actually when you do need stuff when you when you're if it has any kind of uh, pure dependency or anything like that. Is that what you're saying? The, 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 you're having the, the same thing on, downloaded more than once. NPM is especially that way. That's the particular one that broke us. Bower we had to get rid of because we're behind a proxy, so all of our outbound connections look like. 16.8.8.8 or some IP address. And when you're doing a CI CD process where we're building you know, 50, 60 times a day and then every local build is going out there, GitHub is saw that all as one IP address and was starting to rate limit us and would just deny our web connections to GitHub. So we'd have build failures because we were just, uh, they were all coming from the same IP address. So it looked to GitHub like a DDoS. And it wasn't even just our team. HP is, you know, anybody who was behind our proxy. Mm -hmm. We have other teams using using GitHub and Bower as well. So they were all affecting that rate limit as well. Because I mean, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, uh, that's the whole point of Bower now. I mean, to, if if you have dependency X and Y, and they both depend on the same version of A, mm -hmm. they're not going to download it twice. They're going to download once because they see that each other downloads the same thing and doesn't need to download the same thing. Yeah, that, that, what I was saying about the, the, the issue of down, you know, automatically upgrading or having issues there was on the NPM side. So it's more like the implementation of semantic versioning that they're doing. Mm -hmm. and that's been kind of a, a, a thing that we've been disappointed in is the lack of being able to uh, have something like a, like a gem lock uh, that you can really say this is, these are my dependencies. Yeah, and that's, like I said, one of the problems that we had was, um, you know, that you can't specify, you know, that transient dependency that's right. further down. You can't just lock it in and say this is all I want to use. Totally, totally. So, There's a Bower plugin called, uh, 
train craft, I think, that's okay. supposed to handle that. I've never tried it. But <laughs> yeah, I know that that's like an ongoing uh, issue with NPM. And supposedly NPM is working on it to be able to lock that stuff down because how are people supposed to reliably work um, <laughs> with that tool? Yeah. When there's stuff like that. I was just going to ask something about um, Rockets. There was a, a talk at NGConf. Um, this guy gave a whole um, half hour or 45 minute talk about um, making his case for why you would use require and I think it's a thing. Kind of, I've been doing my own research and doing this and, you know, does the internet think I'm stupid for wanting to require anything? So my, my question I was trying to ask was, because I felt like people were going to say, no, you don't need it. Angular already does that. It does it has some crossover, but not, you know, there's still like file based injection versus actual instance injection. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. So so I was reading about it, and, but I came across that as a great So anyway, I know you didn't have code or anything to share and stuff like that, but um, there's a, a guy who did the presentation actually has like a, a project out there, and I think like a seed.